Welcome to Sure Foundation Lutheran Church's podcast channel. The following sermon was preached as part two of our sermon series, Live Generously. This one is called A Picture of Generosity, based on 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 7 to 16. It is no secret to anyone that we have experienced a long period of dry, hot weather. And while this has some effect on our lives, it's minimal compared to what life was like before irrigation systems and global distribution systems. We are so blessed. Even if it didn't rain here for an entire year, our grocery stores would still have food in them because it likely rained somewhere else and we can bring that food to us. Droughts affect us, sure. Droughts affect farmers, absolutely. But as an entire community, city, or state, the effect is not nearly like it used to be, like it was at at the time of Elijah. Elijah was a prophet of God during the reign of one of the most wicked kings of all of Israel, King Ahab. Uh, We read 1 Kings 17 today, starting at verse 7, uh, but At the very beginning of that chapter, 1 Kings 17, we see Elijah talking with Ahab. And Elijah's passing on a message from God in which he's saying that there's not going to be rain or or even dew on the ground except at the word of the Lord. And so to King Ahab, this would have been devastating. To the region, it would have been devastating because this is already an arid, dry region. And so not having any rain was, was almost a death sentence. Elijah was going to experience this too. But God took care of Elijah during this time. He first had Elijah travel at his direction to the Kiriath Ravine, east of the Jordan. He went there on God's instruction because there was a brook there that he could drink from. And he was able to get water from the brook and the Lord provided for him. Not just water, but he provided food as well. God had the ravens bring Elijah bread and meat. Now, at first, maybe we recoil at the thought of a bird bringing us food. He maybe wanted a three-piece fish fry, but he was thankful for what God had provided for him because this was desperate times here. But the drought was was so bad and got even worse that, that the brook that God had provided for Elijah had, had dried up. And so the Lord directed Elijah to travel to Zarephath in the region of Sidon. It's probably on the northernmost part of the kingdom of Israel, if it, is, if it even is in the kingdom of Israel at all. And the Lord says that when he gets to Zarephath, he's going to meet a widow there that's going to provide for him. Now, it's useful for us to, to maybe pause and think about how this would have sounded to Elijah. Hear this through Elijah's ears. Uh, he, he didn't have much provision at this point at all. Um, he, he had nothing by way of resources and God's telling him to travel a great distance on foot with the hope that he's going to meet a widow. Now now widows were not typically wealthy and a widow would have been an unlikely candidate to be a benefactor. But Elijah trusted the Lord and he went. When he arrived in Zarephath, he meets this widow at the, the gate of the city. She was gathering sticks and as he approaches her, he asks her for something to drink. Perhaps how she responds tells you a little bit about this widow's heart and her character. Because she turns immediately to go get him some some water from a jar. And she's going to help this man. And as she's going, Elijah calls out after her, Please bring me a little bread too. Now before we we get on Elijah for being greedy here, remember he's traveled a long distance. He, He doesn't have much by way of provisions. As this woman looked at him, she could likely see that he desperately needed water and he needed the food that he was asking for. But there was a problem. This widow was not doing well herself. She only had a handful of flour left and a little bit of oil. She was gathering sticks so that she could go make a little bit of bread for her and her son and and that would be the end of, of their food without any hope of getting more. She thought that they might even die because of this. And so she certainly didn't have enough to provide for Elijah. 
And at this point, you may expect to hear Elijah say something along the lines of, great, <laughs> this is exactly what I expected, God, when you, you told me to go meet this widow in Zarephath. He may have expected, and we may have expected him to say that, but Elijah trusted the Lord, and Elijah was the prophet of God. He, he was the mouthpiece of God, and so Elijah is going to speak on behalf of the Lord, and he speaks to this woman a promise. He says, Go make the bread and give me some first, then make some for you and your son, because God will provide flour and oil until rain falls on the land. So now this woman has a, a decision to make. Is she going to trust the word of the Lord through Elijah the prophet? Or is she going to trust what logically makes sense to her? That if she uses up what little she has left, then, then she won't have any. In applying this section to ourselves, we could go a lot of different directions here. We could talk specifically about how when we give our offerings, we physically have less. We could talk about the difference between an abundance mindset or a scarcity mindset. We could talk about the inner struggle that we have in deciding how much to give and how often to give or, or whether to give at all. But the heart of this section is even deeper and has a deeper application than the amount of your paycheck that you designate to the Lord. Those are applications that we'll get to, but, but first we need to talk about the heart of this section, which is trust. But sometimes we learn well from seeing the opposite, so let's illustrate this using our other gospel lesson from Luke. In this reading, Jesus told a parable about a man who was richly blessed with an abundance of, of harvest. This man was already rich, and he already had his philosophy of life. He was going to store up as much as he could so that he could take life easy. He could live securely with, with safety and not, not worry about anything. He could be comfortable. And so this abundance that he got in this, in this harvest, uh, he was going to stow away just like he had for, for years. But the problem was is he didn't have a, a big enough barn. And so he even tore down his smaller barns and built bigger ones so that he could stow away all that he had. Then he could feel safe and secure in what he had accumulated. And he could live a life of comfort free from worry. To this man, true happiness, true security, and true meaning was found in his wealth. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Essentially God is saying, You have spent your whole life accumulating things and finding peace, security, and meaning in money. But when your life is demanded from you, when Jesus comes back to judge the living and the dead, what good will your possessions do for you? What good would it have been to spend the majority of your life accumulating money rather than seeking after God? Can we compare these two stories, these two pictures? The rich fool had an abundance and stored it away so he could live comfortably. This widow gave what little she had left and trusted the word of the Lord through Elijah. One trusted the Lord, the other trusted their wealth. That's the heart of what God wants to communicate with us. If you're going to put your trust in wealth, then you're going to be left empty. Or, for your life, are you going to put your trust in God? And this isn't just a temptation of the wealthy. There are plenty of people with a low net worth that look to money as their savior. Even though they don't have much, they still believe that money is the answer to their problems and they continue to serve the almighty dollar. And so no matter what your, your bottom line is, it's spiritually unhealthy to look to money to give you what only God can give. And God's concern here is for your heart. In Matthew chapter 6, he said, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one or love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Who will have the number one place in your heart, God or money? God wants more for you in your life than just spending all your time and effort accumulating money and possessions. He doesn't want you to get to the end of your life and realize that you've been chasing after something that is perishing. God knows that it's easy for us to, to get lost in the temporal. 
but he wants us to chase after the eternal because the eternal is worth infinitely more than anything in this life. What Jesus did for you is worth more than any amount of money could quantify. No dollar amount could capture the value of the forgiveness of sins. No dollar amount would be able to buy the sal- what salvation from sin, death, and the devil is worth. Jesus has, has ushered you into a life of transcendent peace and, and, and heavenly blessing because he paid the ultimate price for you. And so it's no secret to Christians that the eternal is of far more value. And so Jesus encourages in Matthew chapter 6, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. So rather than spending your life chasing after temporal comforts, Jesus encourages you to spend your life chasing after spiritual treasures. How do you suppose we do that? Well, for one, we spend time collecting for ourselves treasures in God's Word. The time that you have to spend in God's Word, whether it's the 15 minutes that you have at home or in Bible study or at church, this is the most valuable and precious time that you have. In this time, you're refreshed by your faithful God and your trust in Him is bolstered. Remember, we said earlier that the heart of this section was all about trust. Trusting in God rather than trusting in money. Uh, Our trust for God grows the more we learn about him and hold tighter to his promises. This widow trusted the word of the Lord through Elijah and she gave. This wasn't just an act that was pleasing to Elijah, but it was pleasing to God. Her trust was, was not in the little she had left, but her trust was in God. There's a biblical connection between trust and giving. And so, since there is a direct correlation between trust and giving, there's two big things that we can draw from this. Only the trust that God's word inspires will motivate giving and growth in giving. That's number one. And number two, giving is not just a physical act, but it's highly spiritual. So, So let's unpack these briefly. When it comes to living out of thanks for God, your connection to him and his word, it matters. If you're disconnected from God and his word, then you should not expect growth in godly living. But those who stay connected to God and his word have the ability, through the work of the Spirit, to grow in their godly living. To respond to God with acts exhibiting trust and and to, to live a life investing in the eternal. In this case, in the area of generosity and giving. Here's what that might look like for you. You may find yourself in one of these five groups on your spiritual walk with God. Number one, you maybe haven't given before. And so an act of growth in your godly living, in your generosity, would be to give for the first time. Group number two, maybe you have given for the first time, and so maybe a step of growth would be to give occasionally. Maybe you already give occasionally, and so you fall, you fall into group number three. A step of growth for you would be to become more intentional with your, your giving, to have a set amount at a set time that, that you give to, to God. Maybe you already do that. And so maybe a step of growth for you would be to move in, into the 10% giver slot, that you're going to set aside 10% of your income to give to God on a regular basis. Maybe you already do that. And so maybe a step of growth for you, and really the goal that we're all striving for in our life of generosity is to be an extravagant giver, to be extravagantly generous, meaning that we'd give 10% of our our income and more and find opportunities to give more. I'm not sure where you're at. You probably fall into one of these five groups. Um, But since we we have a desire to grow in godly living, and it's a desire that was put there by the gospel, we want to identify where we're at now and see if we can't take the step to grow in our generosity toward God. Giving's not just a physical act. This this is point number two. It's not just a physical act, but it's a highly spiritual one. By giving, you're practicing letting go of money. Our sinful nature wants to have a closed fist on our money, but the act of giving is the act of opening that fist again and again. 
It is safeguarding my heart against the lure of wealth and the spiritual atrophy that comes with it. And it communicates where my heart lies. Matthew 6 says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Let your treasure be with God, and there your heart will also be. For the sake of full transparency, I spent more time than usual writing this sermon. I'm keenly aware that for many of you, when money comes up in the church, the defenses also immediately go up. It can be a sensitive topic. It's important to say that this sermon is not some ploy to raise funds for the church. Because generosity is not something that God or the church wants from you. But it is what God and the church wants for you. God wants for you to experience what it's like to be generous. God wants you to continue to grow in your trust in him. And he delights to see that trust bear fruit. The widow of Zarephath had a decision to make. Would she be generous toward Elijah? even if it meant giving what little she had left? She did. Not because she was such an amazing person, not because she was reckless, but because she trusted the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, may our trust in you grow as we remain close to you and your word, and may that trust produce good fruit in our lives. Amen.